So a couple of weeks ago, I started having um, momentary issues <clears throat> with my son. I have a 17-year-old. If you haven't met him, his name's Jake. And he's a senior this year. A lot of good things going for him. He'll actually graduate with his associate's degree uh, from Lone Star College. Uh, he's applied to AM. That's his prayer, his hope that he'd get to go. And um, <clears throat> of course, I'm scared in a, in a, I think, in a healthy manner. Uh, it's not one of those, I don't want him leaving my house. It's nothing like that. But do I believe he's ready, maturely, maturity wise, to walk, to step away from a home that I believe is trying to show him Yehovah? show his ways, and to instill that in his life. So having said that, we had some momentary lapses of how he's been raised. And he was showing his little booty uh, with me and <clears throat> with some people in his life. And it, it just boils down to he was not raised to be mean. He was not raised to treat people that way. And I just, I just kept on asking myself, where, where did I go wrong? Like, where was the disconnect? I mean, he's been my kid the whole time, I mean, since birth, and this whole time, whether I was in the Christian church or here, uh, walking in Torah, I've always tried to teach him what it means to respect others, to, to be considerate of others, to treat others as you would have them to be treated, to have them to treat you. Those basic principles that you teach your children at such a young age, and you try and pray and hope that they walk in that, and then he just... I guess he's 17. I don't know what else to say, but he's 17 and he had his issues. So uh, in the process of that, the, the Torah portion of that moment was, um, I'm going to, it was the one before Hazinu, and I'm sorry I forgot the, the name of it, uh, but it's the one, it was last week's, not this past week, but the week before, it starts with a V. Anyway, but it was, I'm sorry? Vayakil. Vayakil, thank you. Um, Anyway, so in that process, that's where the Father really kind of started speaking to me about my part in maybe the void in his life right now, maybe the immaturity part of his spiritual walk. And I, I of course, received it. I mean, I received it, but not really. Anyway, I received it and got my, got my whip in and, and repented. But um, that's why we're going to talk about the fear of Yehovah. So how many of y'all, I mean, we've, ha we've heard over the course of our life many messages over the fear of God, the fear of Yehovah, amen? Um, I've always believed and I've always just kind of reckoned it to, to, to be a pretty surface level understanding of what the fear of Yehovah, Yehovah is. You know, what, what does it mean to fear him? And so that's what we're going to kind of talk about today. So um, let's start. So we're not going to do Deuteronomy 32. We're going to start with De Deuteronomy 31. And the part that I'm actually going to talk about is the mitzvah of Hakel. All right, so that begins in verse 9 of Deuteronomy 31. So let's read together. So Moses wrote this law and delivered it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years... At the appointed time in the year of release, at the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men, women, and little ones, and the stranger who is within your gates, that they may hear and that they may learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully observe all of the words of this law, that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land which you cross the Jordan to possess. Pretty simple, right? So how many times do we see fear the Lord your God? All over. This particular reference, we see it twice. Amen? So what is Hakel? It's really kind of hard to find a, a, a straight-laced uh, understanding of that word, but it essentially means to gather to Yah. Hakel, the mitzvot of Hakel, which is what Moses established during this time, was to gather to Yehovah. But more importantly, what was the purpose of this mitzvah? Deuteronomy 31, 12, the second part of 12 into 13, it says that they may hear and that they may learn 
to fear the Lord your God and carefully observe all the words of this law, and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land which you cross Jordan to possess. So what was the purpose of this mitzvah? For them to hear and to learn to fear the Lord your God. So why do we fear? What is fear? So when we talk about fear in the, and we'll, I'm, I'm going to use some words, fear in the physical. So that means fear in this, in this. This is fear in the physical. So when I talk about what is fear, what would be some examples of what fear is for us? What does it mean? Why do we fear the dark? Sometimes we fear the dark. Sometimes I fear the dark. When it's really dark, it's not the dark. It's what we don't know. I it's the unknown. So it's it's like why do we fear that? Why do we fear snakes? I will I will run faster than my 17-year-old kid and not worry about if he got bit. I'm just saying I don't like snakes. So why do we fear snakes? That's it. The 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 possible Outcome of them being able to slither where they, wherever they want to. What about sna- what about spiders? Teeny tiny. Did you know? Did you know? I'm going to give you a statistic. Did you know? Yeah, you. Did you know that when you're sleeping, they say on the average one in every three people usually have a spider crawl on them when they're sleeping. One in three. One in three. One in three. That's weird. Yeah, that means that one, two, three. You just got. You just got a spider on you. One, two, three. You just got a spider on you. Now, how does that make your skin crawl? I don't like spiders. I, I don't like snakes worse than I don't like spiders. But I don't, I don't want to think in my head, if I close my eyes, there's going to be a spider crawling all over me. But there's already living organisms on you. <laughs> well, they don't look like a spider, and they're a little creepy. So, so why do we fear the future, adults? Let's talk about this. Why do we fear the future, adults? No. Why do we fear the future? Death. Death. What is another reason why we would fear the future? Getting older. Getting older. Failure. Anything else? Disappointment. Yeah. Why do we fear rejection? Why everyone operate, everyone, you know, in that fear, everyone kind of reacts to reject, rejection differently. But the fact of the matter is, is every single one of us fear rejection. Yeah. Why? It's hard. It's hard to put our finger on it. Yeah. Yeah. These may be different for each of us, but the reason is most likely the same. And this is where I want to kind of establish my where God dealt with me. Lack of control. I mean, I don't know about you, but I am a control freak. I want to know that when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to have 35 minutes in the bathroom to brush my teeth brush my hair, go to the bathroom, and I don't want to be disturbed. 35 minutes of silence is not too much to ask for, but I'll tell you, five times out of the seven of the week, I get disturbed. And so it bothers me. So then when I get to work, I usually kind of have somewhat of an idea of what, how my work day is going to be. And where I'm at right now, it's not happening, is it? It is, I, for lack of a better word, it's chaotic. Uh, those, I, I literally have to stop what I'm doing, which I'm usually doing five or six things on the computer, step up and go around and help all these kids. It's fine, but I've had to acclimate myself to that. I'm not in control. And I, for the first time in five years, being at this job is the first time that I've actually been a level, have, have had a level of stress, which has actually induced some anxiety in me. Not something that I worry so much about, but it has, in fact, given me some anxiety, and that's not me. I don't operate in that. Typically, I don't. It's not something that I, that I deal with. But because I have no control of how everything's going to play out for the day, and I have deadlines to meet, it's stress. It's worry. It's like, how are they going to react to me? I don't like letting people down. And if I'm not meeting my deadline, then, of course, it creates anxiety in me. Right. Lack of control. Let's go back to the snakes and spiders. We have control, right? But why is it that we have that sense of fear over a spider crawling on us or biting us or a snake crawling up or snake, you know, slithering to us and biting us? And it's because their mobility is completely different than ours. So again, it goes back to they have more control over I. I promise you, if that snake is small enough, they're probably going to outrun me. 
And if they really want to bite me, they're probably going to bite me. I've already been bit twice in my life by copperheads, and it's not fun. That's why I have a fear of snakes. So spiders, we can't control if they're crawling on us at night. I mean, we can exterminate, but I mean, my gosh, this is their world too. This is their their habitat. So if they come into my house and crawl all over my nose and my ears, and please God, don't let them go in my mouth. But, you know, I, I can't control that, right? Can I control the dark? No. I can't control the dark. Well, yeah, you can. well I, I will not sleep well with the lights on. I'm just telling you. So here's the thing. And can we control rejection? Can we control someone else rejecting us or something else rejecting us? Can we control that? No, absolutely not. I would love for her to be that people pleaser that the enemy wants to tell me that I'm supposed to be in life. And what that does is it sets me up for failure because what happens is I will let someone down. I will not always make everyone happy. Um, I'm not always going to be liked, although I would love for everyone to like me, but not everyone's going to like me. And so in that sense, when I have that standard in my mind, that mentality, it sets me up for failure by that rejection. And when I get rejected, my reaction is I shut down, I back off, and I ignore you. And it's not because you've done anything wrong. It's because I'm going to guard myself from rejection. I don't want to be rejected anymore by you. You've done it once. I shut down. I don't even give you a second chance. So, and it's not a good reaction. It's really not. I mean, it's led to a lot of problems in my life. So, lack of control. What is fear? For a lack of a better phrase, fear is lack of control. When we are fully dependent on our senses, now I'm talking about our physical senses. How many senses do we have? Five. Five. Can you name them? Uh, smell, touch, taste, uh, see, and uh, hear. When we are fully dependent on our physical senses, abilities, and talents, then lose one of them or even all of them, we can become fearful. We lose our ability to control the outcome of our lives and our situations. It's not because our senses were gone. It's because we became fearful. Our imaginations will kick in and can lead to worry, anxiety, depression, and in some extremes, ending our lives. We no longer have a sense of security. Now, I say all that. I don't say we have lost our security. We've lost our sense of security. Amen? I dare say that having a sense of security is actually a plot used by the enemy to get us off track from the will of Yah in our lives. Sense of security and security are very, very different. Amen? So what is the difference between the, feel, the fear of fill in the blank and the fear of Yehovah? Anybody want to Throw something out there. This is this is interactive. Are y'all good with that? Well, rejection or anything like that, um, you can plan the outcome. Whereas Yahweh, you don't know what he is going to do. Where his, I say, where his lesson will come and how it's supposed to shape you, and then how you will take that lesson and how you will move forward. Right. Canon. Yeshua says, "Why fear man that can kill the body, but fear him that can kill the body and the soul." We're gonna... uh, so th this is a real fear we should have. This is a real respect for someone that can completely make That's right. just gone. One's limited and one's forever. Say it again. One's limited and one's forever. One's limited and one's forever. So what if I told you that I had a neighbor that she has such a heavy fear of the what ifs that it's been her limited fear has lasted her almost 30 years. It's a long time, isn't it? It's a long, long time. Even though it's, it is limited, she can overcome it. We believe she can. But 30 years is a long time, amen? amen. I'm, I know of people that are in their 70s and 80s, and they've suffered with anxiety and, and that, that aspect of what ifs. You know, having to have um, a consolation, whether it's in people or in food or in alcohol. There's something. And so it, it, the limited fear, while it is limited... It's still very, very long time. Very, very long time. So what is the difference? Is there a difference? Ah, I'm, I'm going to pose that. Do y'all believe, can you see a difference? Can you understand? Do we have a good, strong understanding of the difference between the fear of this and the fear of Yah? 
Well, let's look at the actual command of Hakel to gather to Yehovah. It is a national mitzvah. All of Israel, men, women, children, and even the stranger are to gather to hear the words of Torah. And it was most likely the book of Deuteronomy or Devarim. Um, we, we know that the book of Deuteronomy was literally... Well, I'm going to shorten this. It's a, it was more of a, a, a recap of everything else. Everything that they had went through um, all the way to the end. And so Moses literally was re reviewing with them how important it was for them to love Yehovah, to serve him, to hear him, to teach it to your generations after you, to fear. There was things that he just, it, was, it sounded like a broken record throughout Devarim. And so that's, that, that's really the speculation, the school of thought on this, is that when they say words of Torah, it was most likely what he had written down as far as the book of Deuteronomy. So where else do we actually see this happen? Again, let's think about what the mitzvah is. It is a national mitzvah, collective, all of Israel, men, women, children, and even the stranger, are to gather to hear the words of Torah. Can we think of anywhere else in Torah that this happened? Mount Sinai. Exodus 20, let's start in 18 and 19. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood far off. Then they said to Moshe, <clears throat> you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. Again, if you think about the entire story prior to that, they were commanded to what? They were commanded to cleanse themselves, wash their clothes, prepare to come and approach the mountain. They were coming. It was an individual thing. And, you know, I, I remember church teachings in that saying, I can't come for you. I can't come for you. can't come for me. You know, we all have to come. So when we see this, yet again, in a pattern of everyone has to come and hear these words, I see that pattern in Mount Sinai. Every single one of us was given Torah. Do you believe that? Torah is not just for your dad. Torah is for you. And you're at, at a point in your life, you will be responsible for knowing Torah, living Torah, and sharing Torah. Do you believe that? You, in, 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 that, in that aspect, that spiritual aspect, it makes you recap going back to Mount Sinai and say, wow, I was there. I was there at some point. Some point I heard when Yehovah gave those commands, when he gave us his word, you were there. And at some point, you will be responsible for sharing, for serving, and for walking in obedience. Amen? So Exodus 20, 20, and Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to prove you, to test you, that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. Now another translation says, so that you may not fear. You go back and you look at that, it's actually the same word, same word. Now my, my translation here says sin, but when I go back, I think I found three translations that says fear. Whether or not it's um, translated correctly, I don't know, but I know that fear will lead to sin. Amen? We know that it's a progressive. So, do not fear, but let his fear come upon you. How does that make sense to us? Didn't everything that they see at Mount Sinai, the thunder, the lightning, the voice, everything, the earthquake, was that not of Yah? Yes. Was that not? But yet we sit here and we see Moshe telling them, don't fear. That's what they were trembling over. It was the physicality, everything that they could tangibly hear, smell, see, touch. They felt the ground shaking under their feet. And yet Moshe is sitting there telling them, don't fear. It's okay. It's okay. How would you feel if we told you, don't fear. It's just an earthquake or, you know, a bolt of lightning that's coming. Don't fear. It's okay. <laughs> yes, it's, it's inevitable. We're going to be fearful. Things that we can't control, things that happen around us, we can't control. So how do we not fear? And he's testing us so that his fear may come upon us. Good question, right? Good question. I still ask it. Israel had to begin their new relationship with Yehovah with a fear of who he is for this covenant to even succeed. So when we step into a covenant, you got a question? So essentially you're saying that he's testing us with fear. 
He was testing us, but not with fear, no. He was testing us. But the thing is, is there was a test to define where, what were we going to bring to this. Again, this is a covenant. So most covenants outside of maybe, I only know of two, uh, most covenants were a if-then, meaning it was two-sided, relational, okay? A conditional covenant. So when we talk about a conditional covenant, the, to- the covenant at Mount Sinai, which was with Torah, was conditional, So if we think about that, when he gave us those commandments, what was the condition? If you obey, if you listen to my voice, if you heed this, if you turn your backs or turn your eyes from idolatry, idolatry, then I will bless you. I will multiply you. I will give you the land that I promised your forefathers. There's a lot of ifs and then. So when we talk about a covenant, yes, that was the covenant that happened. I mean, that he promised a long time ago. But at this point, these are the people that are actually getting the covenant. They are standing at Mount Sinai, and they're fearful of everything that is being um, theatrically... I mean, everything that's happening is because the Shekinah glory is coming. He's there, and they can't handle it. They can't handle his voice. They can't handle the presence. So they're telling Moshe, you talk to him. We don't want to talk to him. We will step back and we will just let you be the mediator like you've been doing this whole time. We don't want this. And Moshe is telling him, Moses is telling him, don't fear. Don't fear. This is a test. He wants to know if you're going to fear him. Okay, so keep that in mind. 2 Samuel 23, 23, the God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men must be just ruling in the fear of Yah. Second Chronicles 19.9, And he commanded them, saying, Thus you shall act in the fear of the Lord, faithfully and with a loyal heart. Nehemiah 5.9, Then I said, What are you doing? Or, I'm sorry, what you are doing is not good. And if you go back and read the context of that chapter, they were in there and they were not doing what they were supposed to have done. They was in the process of coming back into the land. They were going to start preparing to build the temple. He says, what, oh, and, and in the process of that, they were actually charging, the, the authorities were charging usury to the people. And they were, the people were asking, okay, shouldn't we be getting our land back? You know, isn't this what we do on this the Shemitah? And we're supposed we're supposed to kind of be getting some stuff back. And they were charging them usury, so they weren't following Torah. So it says, Nehemiah said, Then I said, What you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies? Why should we fear God? According to Nehemiah, we should be fearing God so that nations don't sit there and say, Well, you don't fear him. You're telling me to fear him, but you're not. So when we talk about being a hypocrite. And we wonder why so many people don't want to come to this way, to come to this movement. I have to really look in the mirror and say, well, what am I reflecting? What am I showing? Am I being a hypocrite? Am I, am I being a reproach? Uh, or am I being uh, a hypocrite based on what the nations know of what Torah says? Now, all they know is black and white. They don't know that there's a heart involved behind the, the walk here. Amen? But the fact of the matter is, is they don't see my heart. They see my walk. They see my actions daily. And if I am walking in a hypocrisy, in a wishy-washy, lukewarm manner, then I am not presenting my, bro- my groom to them in an in a honorable manner. Am I not? Amen. Job 28, 28. And to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Psalm 5, 7. But as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy. In fear of you, I will worship towards your holy temple. Psalm 34, 11, come, you children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. The fear of Yehovah at its core is recognizing that we are not in control. So what, where does the shift, the definition of fear does not change. The shift of understanding why we should fear this or him and not this is what shifts, is what changes. Amen? It is a deep understanding of his sovereignty over the world, over creation, over mankind, over the universe, over eternity. About, I don't know, it's probably been, it was when we were dancing, so has that been about seven years ago, maybe? It's, I can't keep up. There was a time where the whole year I was in Jeremiah, I think I've told y'all this maybe once before, but in that sense, in, in reading all that and being depressed that whole year because Jeremiah is a very depressing book. Uh, he t- 
taught me his, what sovereignty is. He taught me to get a better understanding of sovereignty. Um, and I, I was able to. And in that, not only just reading Jeremiah, but under, given, getting that insight and that revelation of sovereignty allowed my intercessory life, my prayer life to change. It completely shifted um, how I prayed for people, how I interceded for people. Sovereignty, knowing his sovereignty, knowing, having an understanding of him being over everything. He is over everything. He knows every hair on your head. Did you know they're counted? Your Elohim, your creator, knows every hair on your head. Knows what you're going to do this afternoon before you even do it. To know that kind of sovereignty, to have a knowledge of who he is, is when you get a healthy, a holy, and a, a reverential fear of Yehovah. Pretty awesome, isn't it? Everything must go through him. Everything. Everything must pass through his hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This kind of recognition is the only thing that separates the fear of Yah and the fear of everything else. Amen. As much as we see the pattern of Mount Sinai in this command, there are some vital elements, and we're going to talk about that, from being able to encounter, that are missing from, being in, from the encounter, being able to encounter the same soul trembling that the Israelites do. So we talked about, you know, the physical. You remember talking about the thunder and the lightning, the earthquakes, the fire coming down, the cloud, and then the voice. We didn't, we didn't know what it was, okay? Can you imagine being there? You're trying to grab onto Dad's cloak and be like, I don't know what's going on. All of that was missing in this command of Hakel. We don't have the thundering, the lightning, the trembling, and, and the earthquakes. So what I call pageantry, and I don't mean it loosely, I mean I, I mean it in, this, in the sense. They were scared of what their senses were seeing, their, their eyes, their ears. They were scared of that. That was the fear that came in because they were sensing something was not right. Okay, but that wasn't true. So here's the thing. If that's all gone, how does this mitzvah expect to produce or invoke the same fear, that reverential fear that this command is actually calling for? Again, it's very specific. This command is for this, right? There was no, there was no hidden agenda with this, with this command. It says, so that you may fear the Lord your God, so that your children who do not know it may fear the Lord your God. We know plain as day what it's for. So how does this mitzvah, how does this command expect to produce or invoke that same fear without the thunder, without the lightning, without the fire and the earthquakes? How? Hmm. If, you, if I was just standing up here and reading the book of Deuteronomy for you, would that bring a fear? Mm -mm. Kind of gloss over it, don't we? After a certain time, we probably kind of start tuning out and we can become lulled, lulled to the sound of the verse. Amen? So I believe this is where the timing is so important. Deuteronomy 31.10, let's go back. It says, And Moshe commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, at the appointed time, in the year of release, at the Feast of Tabernacles. Very specific to the timing. Amen? Do we know that his Moedim are very specific? Amen. Everything he commanded in time is very specific. Amen? So what's so special about this year? What is the year of release? It is the seventh year. What do we call it? Shemitah. 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 Do you know what it's called? Okay, so that word is called Shemitah, and it means the Sabbath year. The seventh year. So the year of release, the Shemitah year, the Sabbath, the Sabbath year, every seven years Israel was commanded to let the land rest. This means no sowing, no plowing, no working the land. They were fully reliant. Easy, it says Israel must allow it to rest, thus the name Sabbath for the year or the year of release. The land had to rest. So when, when we try and explain to people why we take the Sabbath seriously, of course, you know, when I kind of stepped into it, it was just like, God told me to do it, I'm going to do it. Didn't really have a full revelation. But then, because out of my obedience, I didn't have a full understanding, but out of my obedience, He gave me understanding and He made me understand that I'm coming to a place of rest. I'm ascending to a place of rest, both in time and in space. I've created a Sabbath space. I've created a Sabbath time. And He is giving me rest for my weary soul. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are to extend that to the land. 
Now, we're talking specifically about Israel, but we know that we can apply these things wherever he's planted us. Amen? And so if I'm, I'm growing a garden at my home, and it's been this will be the second year, then I know I'm not on a corporate seven year because we don't technically know that. I mean, they do. I don't know if it's accurate or not. I can't answer that. I'm just saying. But for my land, for my property, I know that on that seventh year, I'm not going to sow it. I'm not going to plant anything. I'm going to allow my land to rest because I want to understand why. I want to understand why is he having me do this? Why is the command there? I might not be in Israel, but I want to do the best that I can to, to walk in an understanding of why he commanded it. Amen? So Deuteronomy 31.10, again, we go back to the year of release. It's very specific, very, very specific. Why is the timing so important? The Shemitah or Sabbath year for the land is not just about allowing it to rest. What is it? Relying on Kodesh. Actually, well, it is Kodesh, but what are we doing in that whole year? We're no longer relying on our hands. We're no longer reliant that I sowed a seed in about six to eight weeks. I'm going to get a bean pole. I'm fully reliant. Now, mind you, I have Walmart, so I will never quite comprehend the reliancy that he's at, the dependencies he's calling me to, to understand, right? Because I know that even though I'm not planting that garden, I can go to Walmart and pick a, a, buy a cucumber or buy a zucchini. You know what I'm trying to say? So, but I'm do, I want to understand it. I'm not saying that I want to walk in like never go get canned goods. He may get me there. So I don't ever want to say that'll never happen. But you know what I'm trying to say. Y'all get it? We have grocery stores. People have provided for us. But I am planning a garden because number one, I believe God wants me to eat seasonally for my health. But number two, because he wants me to understand what it means to nurture the land. To truly nurture the land with the way we've called, been called to do. Amen? So it's also about reminding us that we are not in control. Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. The world and those who dwell therein. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The earth is the Lord's. It's not mine. It's his. The earth, the rain, the growth, it's all in Yah's hands every time we work the land. Yet we tend to forget this and we begin relying on our efforts rather than his sovereignty and power of creation. Can you imagine, just think about it, in that day, no Walmart, everyone's commanded to let the land rest. Twelve months of having to rely, trust, and have faith that Yah will provide sustenance for you, your family, your, your livestock. And we all say that we would, right? We trust Him to provide. But if we're put in that position, do we truly have an understanding of what full reliance on the Father is? I don't. I don't. I don't. And I, I want to fully rely on Him. Amen? I want to be fully dependent on Him. If we don't walk in that trust, very likely we choose to obey because we fear what might happen if we don't sow the land. So say you're a farmer and it's the Shemitah and you might have stored some grain. I mean, it, most likely there was some wisdom there to store the grain, but there's also commands, you know, for new grain and things. Is there not? Is that, that command is still for Shemitah that they are to offer new grain. So again, we're going back to full reliance on that Yah will provide the new grain for them to offer up. It's a lot of dependency. So you're talking about a man and a woman, you know, their family along with the livestock, having to not only rest, allow the land to rest, but fully understand and believe, trust that he's going to provide every need. It's hard. It's hard. Do you feel right now with your with us praying over your commercial property? We have faith that God will answer. We have faith. We believe that he will he will cause provision to come to you because he desires for his children not to be in debt to anyone. Amen. So that's your land. So we're just declaring that God is faithful. Yah is faithful to 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 operate in his word. And if you've been faithful, and he's always faithful regardless. 
And we're going to walk in trust that he's not going to cause a lien to stand on that commercial property. And we can stand here and we can say this and we can say this and we can say this, but every day that we don't get that fullness of the promise, it's like, okay, God, I don't want to get discouraged, but I want to trust you. Is that not how we operate? I mean, and it's hard, but we get there. Amen? Amen. So why is this timing so important? We are forced through this command of Shemitah to relinquish our sense of control so that we recognize yet again who Yehovah is, thus teaching us the fear of Yehovah. But in this fear, we actually find faith and trust. Twelve months, guys. That's a long time. So let's revisit the question, why the Shemitah? Because your faith and trust, my faith and trust, and most of all, fear of Yehovah has been revived, refreshed, renewed throughout the year. It heightens your senses to recognize and acknowledge Yah's sovereignty in fear and awe of who He is, almost like Mount Sinai, as the Torah is read aloud for all to hear. Unity attracts the presence of Yah. Let's look back at some of the things that we, can, we know for sure. Mount Sinai, the presence of Yah. Let's go back a little further. Tower of Babel. Did it not attract the presence of Yah? I wouldn't want to be, I would not have wanted to be there because it was not the right kind of unity. So when we pray for unity, and I think we should, we need to be extremely specific saying, Father, we pray for unity in you. In you, not with man. I pray for unity in you. And those who pray that will fall into unity. And guess what will happen? It attracts his presence. And is that not our goal? Is that not our goal, to, to, to be able to dwell in the beauty of His holiness, in His presence? Is, that's my goal. If I had a finish line, that would be it, to know that I'm standing in the presence of the Almighty. So, why was I led to speak of the fear of Yah? I told you all the story about my little 17-year-old. Wanted to drop kick him a couple of times the last two weeks. And, uh, <clears throat> but this is where he really dealt with me. Okay, have I taught him the fear of the Lord? The answer is no. Not, not like I should. My mom and dad didn't teach me the fear of the Lord. And so when we were talking about that prayer request about those two students, I didn't have a fear of the Lord. I just had a church life. Day in, day out. It's every Sunday night, Sunday morning, Wednesday night, every Easter outreach, Christmas outreach, Hallelujah night or Halloween, every fall festival, I was there. I, I worked in the nursery. I taught Sunday school. I led, led choir. Um, there were so many things. I was active. I, I, was, I was a church kid. But I never understood what it meant to fear the Lord. Yes. To understand why everything that has happened to put me in this place has happened. I never understood it. All I knew is I was a church kid and I was far better than the one who wasn't going to church. That's the attitude I had. Very, very prideful, very haughty. I was riding on the coattails of my parents. Isn't that what they think? Well, gosh, you've been in church your whole life. You know your mom and dad taught you everything. You're going to heaven. Don't worry about it. I'm, that's, I'm telling y'all, I am clearly explaining to you that is what I had this conversation with those two students. And all I could see was me in his seat. And I was like, Father, if I can keep him from going one more day without knowing who you are, Please save his life. That's all I said. Like, God, I, I, you didn't give me a door open right now because I have to follow the law. So save him. Protect him this weekend, Lord, and bring him back Tuesday and let his words, his heart ask me who you are because I don't want him to never go another day not experiencing the presence of his creator. Even at that young age, they should know they should know. Even a, a slight glimpse, y'all should know. Do you know who your father is in heaven? Do you know who he is? Have you experienced the love? Even if it's when your dad hugs you, do you experience that? And you go, wow, if my dad loves me that much, 
how much more does my Father in heaven love me? Something that we need to know. Something every adult, I think, also overlooks. Amen? Deuteronomy 31, 12 through 13. Gather the people together, men and women and little ones, and the stranger who is within your gates, that they may hear and that they may learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully observe all the words of this law. That their children, who have not known it, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land which you crossed the Jordan to possess. So why, why am I to hear the words of this Torah? So that I can make sure to teach my children, that I can teach Jake the fear of Yehovah, the fear of the Lord, so that when he does leave the nest, when he does walk away from me, even though he might fall and he might stumble, he will remember who he is and he will remember the fear of a, of a holy God and that he will walk in all the ways that he is stood for. I'm not saying it's going to be every day for Jake. And I'm going to have to relinquish control of that. And that's where, instead of fearing him, fearing that Jake's going to make bad decisions, I need to fear Yah. Yeah, I know that. that he, and, and let him build my trust that I gave Jake to him 17 years ago. And I am standing on the promise that he will be faithful to walk with him. And that Jake will surrender to him. Even if it's just the day that he dies, I know he'll surrender. That is my promise. Psalm 34, 11, Come, you children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 1, 7, The fear of Yehovah is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 22, 6, Train up a child... In the way they should go. And when he is old, he will not stray. He will not depart from it. So when dad's training you up in the way you should go, just remember that's his promise. That right there is your dad's promise saying that when he is old, you won't stray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. So why was I led to speak of the fear of Yahweh? We're going to talk about this declination or the declining through disobedience. As parents, we have been disobedient. Maybe me more than others, but let's look at the corporate aspect of this. I can go back from my great-grandfather. I did not know him. I only had a grandma that I, I knew that lived out. But I know that when he was raising my grandmother... He raised her in the fear of the Lord. I specifically remember that when we would have our conversations, my grandma was very, very, loved the Lord. She was so sweet. Wasn't mean, never mean. She would just pat you. Say, Jesus loves you. Just remember, Jesus loves you. He loves you so much, Tammy. And that's what I would get. And I loved being around my grandma. But in those times, she would also say, just remember to fear God. Jesus loves you. You know, so it was like, fear God. Jesus loves you. But it stuck with me. And then, then we go into my mom and dad. My mom raised us. Mom and dad both raised us in church, raised us to know that we needed to hear the word. But again, we're going back to, I saw, now looking back on it, I saw where my mom and her sisters, my grandma taught her. They would go to church. They would go to VBS. But they didn't rely on church and VBS to teach their children. It was in the home. Amen? Then I had my mom and dad, and my mom ended up having to work full time. You know, when you go into debt, which is what the father never wanted us to do, never intended for us to do, then you're pulling that keeper of the home, the nurturer of the children, away from doing exactly that, and sometimes they have to work full time. Now, don't get me wrong. My mom still taught us what it meant to serve, what it means to love, but there were some areas of the Bible, I mean, so just basic, you know, understanding, like he said, the abstraction of that phrase, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Well, we hear it day in and day out, especially if you're in church all your life, and so it's like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> Hence, the, the student this week. I have been disobedient. I, yes, I've taught my son. 
We would read a Proverbs a day. We would do this. And I've tried to teach him what it means to serve. I've done this. But have I taught him the fear of the Lord? Have I, have I expressed to him, yes, God loves you. God loves you. And he will always love you. But if you are walking in disobedience, there will be judgment. He has promised us that. Is it not? Have we shared that with our kids? We want so bad to, and I, I say this with love because I'm bad about it. I mean, I didn't, I didn't think I coddled, coddled them that bad, but I must have coddled them pretty, pretty bad to not have realized that I had never taught him the fear of Yehovah. Is there hope? Yes. So this is where I'm going to end here. I mean, I had a couple more, but I really want to talk about 2 Chronicles 7.14, but we're going to read... Um, a little bit. So if you'll turn to Second Chronicles 7 and then we're going to end here. By the way, I mean, I was the only one of my family that observed Yom Kippur. And that was a test because the day before and the morning of and all two weeks before, my family knew that I was taking the day off, that I was going to do the best that I could to observe. The night before, they're asking me, what's tomorrow? What is that? The morning of, my son, my husband's like, you're not going to work? No, I'm not going to work. My son comes in, he goes, Mom, why aren't you in, up? You're supposed to go. I'm like, I'm not going to work. It's Day of Atonement. I'm going to fast and I'm going to pray for you people. Amen. So, I mean, I was, I, I was very tried. Don't get it, you know what I'm saying? And they didn't observe. They did not observe. And I pray that next year they will observe. I pray that they will get an, a revelation of it. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, chapter 7 is actually the dedication of the temple, if you didn't already know. This is when Solomon built the temple for Yehovah, and he's dedicating it. Okay, so where I'm going to read, just imagine you're in this big court, and the, the temple has been dedicated. So you're there. You got it? You there? All right. All right. So... When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of Yehovah filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of Yehovah because the glory of Yehovah had filled his house. When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of Yehovah of the, on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and praised Yehovah, saying, For he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. We're going to skip down. Uh, let's go to 8. And this is where I want you to keep in mind, timing is everything. At that time, Solomon kept the feast seven days and all Israel with him and a very great assembly from the entrance of Hamat to the brook of Egypt. And on the eighth day, they held a sacred assembly for they observed the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days. On the 23rd day of the what month? The seventh month. He sent the people away to their tents, joyful and glad of heart, for the good that the Lord had done for David, for Solomon, and for his people Israel. Thus Solomon finished the house of Yehovah and the king's house, and Solomon successfully accomplished all that came into his heart to make in the house of Yehovah and in his own house. Verse 12, Then Yehovah appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer. And I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up, now this is what I want you to listen to, okay? Pay attention. It's not an if. I want you all to listen to this. It's a when. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, sickness among my people, if my people, who's, who's my people? Are you his people? Israelites. Are you are you Israel? Yes. So if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, will pray, and will seek my face, and will turn from their wicked ways, then remember the covenant, if and then, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin 
and heal their land. So we got Second Chronicles seven fourteen. We've heard it all. You know, it's like really just trying to hone in on prayer. You need to pray. You need to pray. You need to pray. Well, of course we need to pray. But how do we need to pray? Humble ourselves. Pray. Seek Yehovah's face. Turn from our wicked ways. Sounds like a lot. A lot like Yom Kippur, doesn't it? Do we not afflict our souls? David was gracious enough to share some revelation that he had that afflict actually does mean to humble. Humble in so many ways. There's so many ways we can do this. We are called to fast. There's many areas where we see in Scripture that, the, that part of affliction is fasting. But we're to pray that day. Is it not a solemn assembly to pray? Did we pray? I prayed. I tried to do my best to stay undistracted and to focus prayerfully, not only to intercede for myself and repent, but also to intercede and repent for the nation, for those that don't know. I want to see the world saved one person at a time if, if need be. I don't, I don't know who's going to receive, but it's not for me to know. I'm supposed to be faithful, right? And faithful in prayer. I'm supposed to seek his face. Hallelujah. If I'm seeking his face, what's going to come upon me? The fear of Yehovah. If all I'm seeking is his hand, provision, I will never truly understand what it means to fear him. But when I seek his face then I start understanding sovereignty. I start understanding He's in control and I am not. And that's a good place to be. Amen? Amen. And then turn from their wicked ways. I want my son to know you sin. We sin daily. We fall short daily. We do. But you are no longer a sinner. You have been saved. You have been saved. Every day you stand up and you say, Father, humble me. Walk with me. Keep me from walking in sin. But help me to walk in righteousness, your righteousness, and all humility. Sounds a lot like Yom Kippur. I'm probably going to stop here. Um, I feel like that's probably where I need to stop. Um, there were consequences of idolatry and everything. I want to go all the way to the end, and I want y'all to uh, just take note of these two chapters. Uh, Matthew 10 is a good one, and we can, we, if y'all want to, I don't know who's doing Midrash, but we're welcome. If y'all want to, we can read Matthew chapter 10. And then, of course, I wanted to reread Torah portion of this week, which is Deuteronomy 32, which is the Hazinu, the Song of Moshe, and it's recapping everything of the ifs and thens. You're going to do this. Amen? But what I want y'all, what I wanted y'all to understand is like, I, this is not a resolution. This is an, an intention of my heart. And I pray that I don't fall short. But I know, I know that there will, there's a strong possibility I will. But even though my son's not going to be with me for all of next year, because he will go off to college, I have but little time. And my heart's telling me that even if at 17, and I've missed 17 years of, trying to t- of teaching him the fear of the Lord, God can restore 17 years of me not doing it in one year. And I'm standing in faith and trust that one year of seed sowing into my son about the fear of Yehovah will surpass all 17 years that I fell short. And so I pray that over every single one of us as parents. Um, even, and I say this also, as you might not be a birth parent where you've actually birthed children, but you might have people in your life that you are a spiritual mother or father to. And I pray that this year that our heart would be to sow in the fear of Yehovah Hallelujah. to everyone that's in our, in our circle. Amen. Yeah.